Hey, I'm having light issues. Okay. There we go. So, obviously I'm in a hangout um, because it's, you know, DBQ writing day. So if somebody comes in, I'm going to have to pause it. Okay. So, we are on Louis the Fourteenth. Okay, look. In your notes, <clears throat> you are right here with Ivan the Fourth in Russia. And now we're going to Louis. Little Louis. Okay, Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth is king of France. But the story actually starts here with Louis the Fourteenth's father. Okay. Louis the Fourteenth's father is not an absolute ruler in any way, shape, or form. No way. In fact, Louis the Thirteenth is totally 100% controlled by this guy. Oh, I made it big. This guy right here, Cardinal Richelieu, Cardinal. So he's like a, a part of the church, okay? Cardinal Richelieu, oops, tells Louis the Thirteenth what to do, tells him what laws to pass, and it's a mindset of, God told me to tell you. So it's still this idea of divine right, but... Louis the 13th doesn't have that mindset. Okay. This is little Louis the 14th. Look at him. Cute little kid. Looks like a little blue burrito. Louis the 14th becomes king at the age of five. Ivan the fourth was three when he became king. Louis five. Can a five-year-old rule by himself? So what does he need? A regent. Well, we're going to have another cardinal be the regent. Cardinal Mazarin. Except the nobles are like, oh, heck no. Uh-uh. We were already controlled by this other guy under his dad. It's not going to happen again. So... The nobles decide, what are we going to do to get rid of the cardinal? Well, we can't kill a man of God. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they come up with this wonderful, make my head bigger, idea. The idea is, let's kill Louis. So it's not okay to kill a cardinal, a man of God. But it's okay to kill a little five-year-old? What? But they do. No, they don't kill him, but they they try. There's like a revolt, but it's not like a whole country revolt, okay? There's like nobles trying to kill him. The revolt is put down, okay? The revolt is taken care of. The musketeers put the revolt down. You've heard of the musketeers? You know, you've heard of three of them? Yeah, there's more like 30 of them right now. There's going to be 60 later, but right now there's 30. Um, but the musketeers, they are just... Elite military men, the best of the best. And they're like bodyguards, basically, for the king. They work at the king's palace, okay? They protect the royalty. They protect the nobility. And they're called musketeers because, I mean, they still fight with swords and stuff. But they also use these new things called muskets, guns, okay? So that being said, the musketeers are there to protect the kid, and they do. They put down the revolt, yay, Louis King, except he's five. And again, Cardinal Mazarin is like controlling things. When Louis is like 15, he should probably get control of his kingdom. Or 16, or 18, or 19, or 20, but he doesn't. Cardinal Mazarin is always telling him, oh, you're not really ready yet. I'll let you know when you are. Cardinal Mazarin is also telling him something else. Louis, you're special. You're special because God chose you to be king. Nobody else, you. Mazarin is, what's the word? Whatevering Louis to really truly believe in the idea of divine right, that God chose you. And because of that, whatever you do is what God wants done. And as a result, 
You can do whatever you want. You can be an absolute ruler and have total control. Louis really believes that. I mean, we can't say like for sure what people believed, obviously, because he's been dead for however long. But he probably really believed that, okay? He, that's what he grows up knowing, being told. That's what he grows up hearing every day of his life, okay? That being said, Louis is going to end up being like the most painted monarch ever. He has so many paintings, it's not even fun. You want to see Louis when he's a little older? Oh, what a cutie. Look at that. What a cute kid. Look how frilly everything is in this, the, the 1600s. Oh, look at that leg. Look at those shoes. I wouldn't even wear those shoes. Nope. Here he is again. A little bit older. This time he's sitting on his throne. Look how kingly he looks. Little Louie. There's another one. Oh, that's Cardinal Mazarin. Just kidding. That's um, that's the cardinal. That's his um, regent. Sorry, I didn't even know this picture was in here. Here's another Louis painting. This is probably the most famous of all the Louis paintings. Um, you see this one everywhere. Look at that hair. <laughs> I just sounded like that old Sir Mix a Lot video. Okay, if you don't know it, don't worry about it. But look at that hair. It looks totally 1980s rock star. Except it's not his, it's a wig. Louis is so powerful and he's such a big deal and everybody wants to be like him that he's gonna start like all these trends, okay? One of the big ones is these goofy wigs. During this time period, the 16 and early 1700s, everybody's wearing these long, big, huge curly wigs. It's because of him, he starts this trend. You see the rest of all the frilliness here. This time period is just frilly. Look at his little, little bloomer pant things. Just frilly. And again, look at those shoes. Man. Um, Louis was not overly tall. I mean, he wasn't. Oh, sorry. My arm's like right in your way. He wasn't like tiny. Sorry, hold on. I'm having an issue. He wasn't like tiny, tiny, but he wasn't that tall. And so by having the big, huge hair and by having the heels, it put him a little bit above everybody else. So it's just kind of a way for him to have a little bit more power over people in like kind of a subliminal type way, okay? So anyway, this is his most famous painting. And you're like, what's with the legs, man? Um, the more attractive your legs for a man, the more attractive you are seen. So during this time period, you really will see a whole bunch of men like sticking their legs way out of their robes and stuff. It's just the style of the time. Okay, here's another Louis painting. That's a wig. Hey, that's a wig. I feel like this wig's a little bit better, although it's still very Motley Crue, very 1980s rock star. I don't even know how many I have in here. Look at this one. Ooh, Louis going to war. He has his armor on. We all wear pretty sashes and frillies to go to war, yeah? Again, it's just very frilly. And yes, he has his wigged hair tied back with a bow. It's just the style of the time. Goofy is all get out, but I mean, it is what it is. Here's another one. Most painted monarch of all time. I feel like he looks kind of decent in this one. Look at that one. That's some twisted sister hair right there. Ooh. Okay, so Louis becomes king, but then he's totally controlled, all right, by Mazarin. Oh my gosh. Okay, there we go. I was trying to get it like where you could actually see the notes. Um, so anyway, Louis's totally controlled by Mazarin. Well, when Louis's 21, I think, I'm maybe 23, I think it's 21, but it could be 23, I don't remember exactly. Point is, he's in his early 20s. Louis has had enough and he takes power. He gives this speech that we kind of refer to as the Sun King speech, where basically he gives this whole like, 
monologue about how God chose me and I'm absolute ruler and I was chosen, not you, and I'm better than you and blah, 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 blah. Then, of course, you know, some nobles are killed because if you don't kill some, then nobody's going to believe you. And then he shows up with a whole bunch of musketeers. Because unbeknownst to everybody else, he doubled the number of the musketeers. So there were 30 under his father. Yeah, now there's 60 because he knows he's going to need some protection because he's about to make a whole bunch of nobles mad. He also, it's called the Sun King speech because he refers to himself as the Sun King. He gives this quote, thank you. He gives this quote where he's like, did God cause the sun to rise for you? I don't think so. But you know what happens every morning when I wake up? The sun rises. And every day, night, when it's time for me to go to bed, the sun sets. God causes the sun to rise for me and fall for me. Does he really believe that? I don't know. Is he really that narcissistic and that selfish and that focused on himself? I don't know. But Louis does something when he takes over. He says, listen here, nobles. I remember you trying to kill me as a child. I remember being a little five-year-old running around Versailles. No, there is no Versailles. Just kidding. Running around the castle. Like, you guys are trying to kill me. I remember all that crap. He says, I don't think it's cool. I don't trust you. So here's what we're going to do. Every single noble family has to move to my castle. Every noble. You cannot live in your castle anymore. You can keep your old family land. You can keep your old castle. Go for it. But you cannot live there. You live in my house. The idea, y'all, is keep your enemies close so that you know what they are doing and so that you know what they are planning. That's the idea. If his nobles are at the palace with him, he's doubled the size of the musketeers. They can keep an eye on it. Okay? So... Every noble has to move to Paris. It's not really Paris, but I'll explain in a minute. They're going to have to move, okay? Would you be okay with that? You're like, yeah, because I get to live in the castle. Well, there is a little something else. The nobles are put on a rotating schedule. They serve Louis XIV. Louis is too good to be served by a peasant. A peasant doesn't bring Louis his food. A peasant doesn't bathe Louis. A peasant doesn't, I don't know, whatever, dress Louis or wipe his booty or whatever the nobles do. Louis has so much control over his nobles that whatever he tells them, they do. You're like, what if they don't? And they die. Kids are always like, I wouldn't do that. Then you would die. Well, then I would. Okay. Hmm. When, when the nobles are pretty sure that he's serious, because nobles have died, they do whatever he tells them. So they literally are on a rotating schedule serving him. It's not the peasants. Now, peasants work at the palace. They serve everybody else. Nobles serve him. And some of the nobles didn't serve him like in that kind of petty way. Some of the nobles served him in other ways, like um, um, advisors and stuff like that. Okay. So it's not just, I just got a text from the office. Okay. So anyway, I don't know if I can pause this. I'll just wait. I'll just wait. Okay, so anyway, um, it's not always in little petty ways like that. It's sometimes bigger advisors um, in charge of war stuff, but they are serving him. What he says goes. I want you to look at his dates. He, was, he is one of the longest serving monarchs in history. Queen Victoria is going to be queen longer than him. And now Queen Elizabeth, right now, Queen Elizabeth has bypassed him. 
but he was king for a long time. I mean, when you become king at the age of five and you live to be an old man, you're going to be king for a long time. The, the, the French nobility is going to go through kind of a transformation, okay? Under his father, they have a lot of power. Under him, that power gets all taken away. It's gone. And at first, they're really ticked off about it. Thank you, sir. They're really mad. But then eventually, they're like, you know what? This isn't so bad. I mean, I have to serve him once a week or whatever. But for the rest of the time, I get to live at the Palace of Versailles. See, here's the thing. There's too many nobles to live at the palace in Paris. So Louis is going to build a new palace. It's called Versailles. It looks like Versailles, but it's Versailles, the Palace of Versailles. Um, Versailles was like 12 miles or something outside of the city of Paris back then. Today, it's just Paris has grown up around it. But back then, it was about 12 miles away, okay? And the reason that he does this is because it, there's just too many noble families. Because, like, the kids are all coming. The grandparents are coming. I mean, everybody has to live there, okay? Bye. See you later. Everybody has to live there. It's a pretty impressive palace, by the way. This palace looks like this. You're like, eh. This is the whole grounds, okay? So like over here, there's like hunting and stuff because that was a big thing to go hunting way out here, right? Um, here you have like the, the horse, I don't know what it's called, the horse thing. This is the actual palace itself. It's kind of in a weird like, I don't know, almost U shape sort of, okay? Um, over here is where you have like gardeners and stuff live. Okay, people on the outskirts. There's a little church for people out here. Um, there's a chapel inside for Louis and his family and the nobles. You have all of these reflecting pools. You have a whole ton. I'll show you the grounds in a minute. You have a whole ton of like um, gorgeous fountains and all kinds of stuff. It was gorgeous. And he calls himself the Sun King. So everything's going to be in whites and golds white and gold. This is Versailles today. And I think this is a really cool picture because you can see the city in the background. Like this is all modern city back here. But this, oops, my head's in the way. This is that kind of U-shaped thing. You're like, I know you, whatever. Okay. Okay, let's look at some up close. Versailles. all that gold fountains louis had so many fountains at versailles that actually if you turned on all the fountains all at once all of them all at once it would suck all of the water away from the city of paris which again is like 12 miles away so all of a sudden if you're in paris and you have like no water it's because louis has all of his fountains going today they don't do that okay they don't I was gonna say they don't play all of them. Today, they don't have all of them going at the same time. But here's what that one, that same one, this one, here's what that same one looks like when it is on. He loved fountains. This one, now it's on. It's off. Now it's on. all these fountains on the Versailles grounds. I love them. Okay, this is probably um, the most famous. Do I have one with the, no. I was wondering if I had one with the sun coming in. Okay, this is probably the most famous um, European palace. Here we go. Look at it. Gold, Sun King. So ornate. I love the ornate style. Ornate means like really decorated. Tons of decoration everywhere. Every single inch there's decoration. I love this style. Um, but, but can you imagine being a peasant working here? 
Today, these are all electrified. It's electricity. Not in the 1600s. All of these were lit with candles. Yikes. Isn't it pretty? Again, I love this style, but it's very ornate. All that gold. Other kings and queens are going to copy his palace and they're going to copy his clothes and they're going to copy his hair and they're definitely going to copy his high heels. They're going to copy him and they're going to start building palaces like this. Um, Peter the Great, Peter the Great, remember him? He builds a palace that is called the Russian Versailles. Um, Maria Theresa in Austria. Oh, she's my second favorite female in history. Um, but she has a palace called the Schönbrunn right in the middle of Austria that looks very Versailles-ish. A lot of people are going to copy. Isn't it gorgeous? So pretty. I love it. Wish I could live there. No, not really. I don't want to live there. I don't want to have to clean all that. I see that as just like... I mean, it's gorgeous. But all I see is what I have to clean. <laughs> so this right here. It's like the most famous of all of the rooms at Versailles. It's called the Hall of Mirrors. Over here, you have windows, okay? And over here, you have mirrors, okay? It's a big, long hall, but Louis did a lot of his, like, parties, dances, feasts, all kinds of stuff in here. Um, he would meet a lot of foreign dignitaries. So like people would come like kings and whatever would come from other countries and he would make sure and have them meet here because he would time it so that his meeting would be at whatever time that the sun was setting. So the sun would come through here and hit the mirrors and like, and like the whole room would light up when Louis was there. Oh, he's so full of himself, but it's a gorgeous room. We don't need that right now, do we? Louis, also at the Palace of Versailles, you see how big it is. Um, he has all of his enemies living there, right? Is that smart? Yeah, it is. Again, you keep your friends, no, you keep your enemies close. But could that also be dangerous? Louis realizes that even having his enemies right there, right where he is, they could still be like psh, 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 whispering and making plans. So he starts bringing in a whole bunch of fun entertainment for them on their days off when they're, when they're not serving him. Like ballets, like especially the Russian ballets. Um, he's bringing in English plays. He's bringing in a lot of the like, um, 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 Austrian, like the Germanic um, musicians and stuff. They're doing all kinds of feasts every day. They're having like parties and like the, the big, like a ball, like, like Cinderella has a ball, big giant parties, masquerade parties, all kinds of stuff. He literally has something for them to do every day, some kind of big to do. So that if you're not working, you're thinking about, oh, what am I going to wear to the party? Okay. That keeps them busy. And that's why I was saying, at first, the nobles are ticked off. But eventually, they're like, eh, it's not so bad serving him. I wipe his booty for one day. And then the rest of the week, I get to party. And I get to have feasts. And I get to wear all these gorgeous dresses. And I don't have to pay for it. After a while, it's not that big of a deal living at Versailles. Huh. Louis wants to be an emperor. Doesn't everyone? Louis wants to be an emperor. Yeah, he's like, oh, God chose me, so I should be an emperor. There's a problem. Here's France. Yeah? Can he go north? Let me change that. Should he go north and attack England? This is the 1600s in England. 1600s. They have the colonies. They're doing pretty well economically and militarily. Don't try to take England. What about Spain? Spain has lost quite a bit of power, okay, in 1588 with the Spanish Armada destruction, destruction, whatever. But still, 
taking Spain could be an issue. And in theory, France is a Catholic country. Spain is a Catholic country. Is the Pope going to let them go to war? No. Nope. So his only choice is to take over the Holy Roman Empire, right? That's too big. So he has a better idea. He says, I'm going to take the Netherlands. Yeah, it's part of the Holy Roman Empire, but I'm just going to come right up here, just like this, and take the Netherlands. Yeah, They're little, they're tiny, they'll be <laughs> taken in a heartbeat because God chose me. Louis fights. Louis loses. Guys, the Netherlands. They have the largest ship fleet in the world. It's not the best. England has the best navy. But they have the biggest. Louis can't fight that. He loses. He declares war a few years later. He loses. He declares war a few years later. He loses. He declares war a total of four times on the Netherlands, and they beat him every time. You're like, what is wrong with him, right? I don't know. I don't know. Here's the thing, and I've told you this before. Wars are extremely expensive, extremely expensive. He's raising taxes as he's having these wars. How are the peasants doing? Are they able to pay? Uh -uh. Nope. All of the best food is going to the military. So when the peasants go to the marketplace to buy food, they're like, where's all the food? There's no food. So peasant life under Louis Fourteenth is pretty bad. But see, here's the weird thing. Because all of the nobles and Louis are 12 miles away from Paris, sequestered in the Palace of Versailles, having parties every day, they have no idea, none, that the people are starving. They have no idea that the peasants are starting to get mad. The peasants are starting to grumble. The peasants are starting to be like, if this guy's really from God, would this stuff be happening to us? Hmm. Guys, the French Revolution is coming. Not yet. He dies in 15, sorry, Louis dies in 1715. 1715. French Revolution starts in 1789. You think Louis has anything to do with the French Revolution starting? You're like, no, because it was like 60 years later. In the grand scheme of world history, 60 years is nothing. It's a drop in the hat. It's nothing. Things that Louis XIV was doing, were doing, whatever, directly impacts, directly impacts why the French Revolution is going to occur. Louis has so much power. And he's seen by the rest of the world, every European king wants to be Louis. Everybody strives to be like him. But why? What has he really done that was good for France? He built Versailles. That's awesome. But the people are starving as a result. So what did he really do? I don't know. Guys, when Louis dies, the mindset from everybody is that France is the strongest kingdom in Europe because Louis looks so strong. But in actuality, check this out. Louis XIV has racked up the largest debt in the whole world. The whole world! Dude, what is the debt coming from? Well, from his failed wars. Well, from having a party every other day at Versailles. Taxing the people to death, he can't pay for all of this stuff with taxes. So he's borrowing money from other places. Here's the biggest issue. 
when Louis dies, Louis the Fifteenth adopts that debt. Debt doesn't go away just because you die. Somebody has to pay it. Can Louis the Fifteenth pay the debt? By the time we get to Louis the Sixteenth. In 1789, some of the countries that have loaned France money, like England, and, uh, Austria, and well, Austria's debt's going to be canceled. That's a bad example. Uh, Spain, Prussia, all these other countries that have loaned them money are like, dude, we loaned you money 60 years ago and you haven't paid it. Pay it or war. Louis the 16th is trying to figure out a way to pay debt because of Louis the 14th. That's what kicks off the French Revolution. Ooh, I love the French Revolution. It's all bloody and fun, but we're not quite there yet. We gotta deal with England first, okay?